Now let us look into the shapes of cell that can be used to formulate a network. So the first and the obvious choice could be a circular cells. Uh, why is it an obvious choice? Because if we have an antenna, base transceiver station, so probably that antenna would be isotropic and it would be radiating in all directions. So it would formulate a circular kind of a shape. Now let us examine if this can be used in an actual network environment. Note that we have different base transceiver stations which are stacked together in an array structure. So for users which are within a cell, they have the coverage. But for the users which are outside the cell and specifically over here, so these users are not covered from any of these cells, right? So this circular cells is not an option to design a cellular network setup. The next candidate can be rectangular cells. So in rectangular cells, we do not have these blank spots right so this seems to be all right in terms of coverage but let us look into some other parameters now let us take the example of this cell so the distance between the base transceiver station over here and the neighboring cell over here say this is d1 at the same time on the diagonal we have another base transceiver station so this distance is say d2 so we can say that d2 is greater than d1 right so if d2 is greater than d1 so the distances are not maintained so rectangular structures are actually also not viable so in short we need a structure in which we do not have these blank spots at the same time the centers of each cell in the neighborhood are equidistant right so these are the two parameters so for that we have a hexagonal cell in the hexagonal cell the centers are equidistant. So this criteria is met. At the same time, we do not have any blank spots. So this is also good, right? So hexagonal cells actually give us one viable option of covering the whole geographical location while giving us an ease in terms of mathematical tractability. So another important factor is that if you're considering specifically this cell and say this is our center, right? So if you draw a circle, so from this circle, we have a coverage area, which is actually quite similar to the one that we had for an isotropic antenna of a circular uh, shape of cell, right? Specifically, this dimension, we can call it as an R, which is the radius. And this is exactly equal to this one, right? But note that the R is only at the edges, not in between. Moreover, if you calculate the distance between the centers of two different cells, so you may call this as D, distance between the two cells. At the same time, we have the radius, which is R. So we can use a simple geometry to measure D. So say this angle is theta. So our cos theta this angle would be equivalent to this vertex until here until this point which is equivalent to d by 2 so from here to here we have d so if you cut it into half so we would have d by 2 so this is d by 2 divided by the radius r so moreover, in this structure, we know that this angle theta is equivalent to 30 degree. So we have cos 30, which is equal to under root 3 by 2. So this gives us the distance D, which is simply under root 3 R. So in short, the hexagonal structure gives us uh, mathematical tractability. We know the radius R from the isotropic antennas and at the same time we can calculate the distance between two adjacent cells so this is also a very important property so let us look into a physical implementation of hexagonal grids on a geographical environment so over here we have a geographical location uh, a part of it is shown to be covered by means of hexagonal grids so though you have a very precise hexagonal structures appearing over here 
but you may have some sort of mountains over here some buildings so based on these physical structures you may not have a very defined form of hexagon so you would have something like this kind of an environment that is as you move away from the base transceiver station you do not have a very crisp boundary but rather you would have a non-linear path loss and fading effects fairly recently we are moving away from the hexagonal st uh, grid structures uh, towards more stochastic structures which are more near to the reality so as we have selected the hexagonal cell for our present discussion let us move forward and look into the co-channel cell frequency reuse distance and hexagonal coordinate systems right so again we have different hexagonal cells appearing over here so this distance is basically the diagonal of a circle that is two times r now assume that we are interested in this particular cell over here and a user is located in this cell which is over here right so this user can be termed as a mobile station so the signal which is projected from the base transceiver station to this mobile station is our user signal this is our desired signal but at the same time the frequency which is used in this cell is not used over here but it is used in this cell over here right so if it is used in this cell so we would have an intercell interference over here uh, which we can call as co-channel interference because the base transceiver station over here is using the same frequency as in this station so we have that co-channel interference so in the meanwhile we also have a metric uh, which is separating the base stations which have similar set of frequencies right so if this is using f1 and this is using f2 f3 f4 so again the f1 appearing over here and the same frequency appearing at a distant cell so the distance between these two cells is termed as d which is nothing but frequency reuse distance so we have a mobile station its intended signal some co-channel interference from other cells of the uh, of the same frequency band and moreover the distance between two adjacent frequency cells which is d next let us look into the hexagonal coordinate system and for that uh, let us look into this particular depiction of hexagonal grid right so it says that localization of hexagon in a hexagonal coordinate system is based on these set of procedures so the first step is that you select a reference so in our case this is set as a reference cell right and we need to locate this cell which is over here so we will start with the reference cell which is this cell move i hexagons along the u axis presently this is our u axis and this is our v axis so we would move i cells in the dimension of u right so presently it is at 2 so we have moved two cells then we have turned 60 degree as mentioned over here and move j hexagons along the y axis right so then we'll be moving in this direction and this is our j which is equivalent to 1 so we have located a hexagon from a given cell or a reference cell by means of i hexagons on the u axis and j hexagons on the v axis now there are some questions which are needed to be addressed over here for example why haven't we moved in the x axis and y axis as in our standard notations so the reason for that is if you're moving in this direction so the issue would be you would be splitting this cell at the same time you would be at the edge of these two cells so this would complicate stuff quite a lot so using this axis which is basically crossing the centers of all the cells in the direction of this vector right so we are considering this as a first axis and the other one as the second axis so this hexagonal uh, coordinate systems uh, is quite beneficial because it is going to give us the number of cells n per cluster so this is expressed mathematically as n is equal to i square plus ij plus j square where i and j are integer values positive integer values right again the n is the number of cells in a cluster and the frequency reuse distance d is proportional to n specifically d is equal to under root n 
that is the frequency reuse distance d is equal to the square root of total number of cells in a cluster let us understand this with help of some examples so in the first example we have divided the band into three subsets right so this is first frequency f1 f2 and f3 so we are interested in uh, locating the total number of cells within a cluster and then comparing it with this expression over here right so from here we can see that this is our cluster and just by inspection we can say the total number of cells that is n is equal to 3 but at the same time say you want to check i right so that is you can do this by measuring i cells in u and j cells in v right so over here our i is if we uh, take this as a center and we move over here so the subsequent cell or the next cell itself is our i so that is i is equal to 1 and at the same time the subsequent cell at 60 degree phase shift is our j and hence j is also equal to 1 so if you insert i and j in this expression so 1 square plus 1 square plus 1 into 1 so you would get n equal to 3 so this justifies the selection of a cluster also over here again the number of cells in one cluster is obviously 4 so that is n is equal to 4 comparing it with this structure so again you start from 1 and say you are finding the adjacent cell this 1 again so this is actually uh, i cells in u this is our new u and then if you take 60 degree you do not need to take 60 degree and go over here because you have already reached 1 right so this means that i is equal to 1 and 2 2 and for the j dimension at 60 degree so this was our original u and at 60 degree we had v so now we have this u and at 60 degree we do not need because we have already reached uh, the same frequency f1 so this means that j is equal to 0 and hence based on i to i square that is 4 plus this is 0 so this will be zeros and 2 times 0 is again 0 so again you would have n equal to 4 based on this so this is also a valid choice so over here our n is equal to 7 and you can use this as u and this as v so if we set this as reference so we would have i equal to 1 and j equal to 1 and 2 right so j equal to 2 so if we set this as 1 square plus 2 whole square that is 4 times 2 into 1 so this would be equal to n equal to 7 as per this choice so this means that the number of cells in a cluster must be as per this expression so over here we have shown that it can be 1 it could be 3 4 7 13 and onwards so you may not have the values for 5 and 6 and so on so as you know that we have found the number of cells the frequency reuse distance for this pattern with n equal to 3 is actually under root 3 so d would be 2 over here and d would be under root 7 for this particular case